And we begin tonight with Donald Trump's reverse snowbird commute to Florida. The twice impeached, twice indicted, liable for sexual abuse former president arrived today in Miami and is spending the night at his Doral Resort as he awaits his unprecedented arraignment tomorrow. He faces 37 felony counts of illegally hoarding classified documents and obstructing the Justice Department's efforts to get them back. While this is his second indictment, this one carries the very serious prospect of significant prison time. He and his personal valet and alleged co-conspirator, Walti Nada, will appear together as they are arraigned. As to who will be representing Trump, that is still up in the air. Like most things Trump, his legal defense is a chaotic mess. As we speak, it's unclear if he has full legal representation. What we do know at this hour is that Todd Blanche, a former federal prosecutor who represents Trump in the Manhattan DA case, will be by his side, even though he has not passed the bar in Florida. Christopher Keyes, the former, the former Florida Solicitor General, who was originally sidelined back in September of 2022, because according to reports, he told Trump that much of this could have been avoided if Trump and his team had simply taken a more cooperative stance with the Department of Justice, could also be in the courtroom. It is unclear if Trump has been able to hire local counsel. A source tells NBC News that at least one prominent figure in Miami has turned him down. I wonder why. Could it be that he has a habit of not paying his lawyers or that he doesn't take advice? A source with direct knowledge tells NBC News that the judge who will oversee Trump's preliminary hearing will be Magistrate Judge John Goodman. Judge Aileen Cannon is still slated to oversee the trial unless she recuses herself. Her earlier handling of this case was universally slammed as prejudicial and outside judicial norms by the Court of Appeals and a bipartisan slew of former federal prosecutors and judges. It is not her appointment to the bench by Trump that's an issue. It's her belief that the former president should be held to a different standard of law. While her impartiality is under serious question, only she can decide if she will recuse herself. And if passed his prologue, there is no guarantee that she will do the right thing. Meanwhile, Trump and his Republican allies have spent the weekend waging a full-blown war on the Department of Justice and the FBI. And with zero sense of irony, Trump accused special counsel Jack Smith of being deranged and repeatedly, without any evidence, that he, Trump, is the target of a political persecution. He also summoned yet another angry mob to Miami to protest his indictment. Today, even after he and his supporters accused the Justice Department of being weaponized against him, Trump vowed to appoint a politically motivated special prosecutor to investigate everything related to President Biden, his family, and basically everybody else that he wants, if he's elected to a second term. Donald Trump, who views winning the election as his best chance for evading accountability and prison time, told his pal and former fellow Floridian convicted felon Roger Stone that there is no way he would drop out of the race. So is there any circumstances under which you could see yourself dropping out of the 2024 presidential election? No, none whatsoever. Now, uh, from from Trump's Doral Resort in Miami, as NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez, uh, and I, I definitely want to hear about the security preparations for tomorrow and what else uh, you're seeing and hearing uh, in Miami. Oh, hi there, Joy. Well, yes, uh, the former president ended up coming here to Doral just several hours ago. He was greeted here by just a few dozen uh, supporters as he went inside. And Joy, over the past hour or so, he has been defiant in several radio interviews he's been conducting with radio stations in Iowa. He said several things. He mentioned some of them, vowing to appoint a special counsel to investigate the Bidens and also cal uh, calling his former attorney general, Bill Barr, a coward. Of course, Barr, over the last several days, yesterday in an interview, uh, saying that the indictment against the former president w was uh, considerably strong. But local authorities here in Miami today, they did describe how they're preparing for this and the, ex uh, the uh, intense security measures that are underway and that there will be enough resources to potentially handle thousands of people, more than 5,000 potentially, tomorrow in downtown uh, Miami. However, Joy, we have no indication that that many people plan to show up. This is just a precaution. You'll recall that during the Manhattan indictment two months ago, there were uh, calls for large-scale protests that never materialized. But again, the former president is uh, here, and there are still lots of questions about tomorrow's arraignment, including which, if any, local council will actually represent him. That has still not been announced as of tonight. 
As for tomorrow, we expect the former president to leave Doral. It's possible we might not see him as he might go into the federal courthouse downtown underground. Then once he is arraigned, he enters his plea. He will then head back to New Jersey, where he plans to hold a speech and fundraiser uh, tomorrow. So, uh, Joy, still a lot of unanswered questions about how this will all go down tomorrow. But the former president here in Doral, Florida, as he awaits this unprecedented arraignment tomorrow, Joy. Wow, what a time to be alive. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez in Miami. Stay safe. Thank you very much. And joining me now is Jill Weinbanks, who served as, as an assistant Watergate special prosecutor. She's co-host of the Sisters in Law and iGen podcast. And former federal prosecutor Paul Butler, who is a professor at Georgetown School of Law. Let's just start, Paul, with the issue of representation. If Donald Trump does not have a Florida barred attorney with him in court, is that a problem? Does he need to find one first? Could that delay anything? It shouldn't delay. In most cases, you have to be a member of the actual district bar where you're being pro where you're representing someone who's being prosecuted. But for a first appearance, most judges will allow another attorney to stand in for that person. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about this judge. <laughs> let's. Uh, I'm going to bring Jill in first, and we're going to both you are going to talk about this. Let me play you what uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder had to say about Judge Aileen Cannon. I'm concerned about her handling this case. Um, based on what she did in the earlier phases of this matter, I'm not sure that she has the legal acumen um, to be a judge in charge of such an important case. Jill Weinbanks, uh, 28 U.S. Code 455A, thank God for great producer, states a judge shall disqualify himself or herself in any proceeding for which her, his or her impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Um, but it is her choice whether she will do that. Um, and I, my understanding is, reporting from Slate, is that Special Counsel Jack Smith does have the option. He can request a different judge. And the 11th Circuit precedent allows reassignment when the presiding judge appears unable to put previous views and findings aside. That feels like it fits Judge Aileen Cannon to a T. But your thoughts on whether or not the Justice Department might or should try to get her bumped off this case? I think you have set it up exactly the way it is. It is a right for the prosecution to ask for a removal of the judge and appointment of a new one. From everything I have heard, it seems very unlikely that the special counsel is likely to do that for a variety of reasons. And, um, you know, I may be Pollyanna, but I do believe in the jury system. And I go back to the Manafort trial, where a very strong Trump supporter said, I believe everything that Trump says, but I was sworn as a juror to vote my evidence in the courtroom. And based on that, I voted to convict Manafort on every single count. And I do believe jurors take very seriously their obligation to go on the evidence in the courtroom. And that the case here, as laid out in the indictment, is so strong is so clear, is so convincing, that there will be a conviction based on the evidence, no matter who the judge is. The thing that we have to worry about is a directed verdict, where the judge could take it away before the jury votes, and that isn't appealable. That is a frightening thing. She also, of course, can delay, and that would cause severe harm, given the upcoming uh, primaries and general election. So there are some things that she can do that are extremely dangerous and harmful to justice, to our rule of law. That's what we have to watch out for. Well, I hadn't even thought about the directed verdict, and now I'm even more terrified. Uh, Paul, because the thing about it is, the, you know, Donald Trump is presumed innocent until proven guilty. He gets the presumption of innocence. But the people of the United States, because it's the people versus Donald Trump, the people also have a right to a fair trial. I can't imagine that the people of the United States, with our national security at stake, can get a fair trial in front of this judge. As a prosecutor, if you were in the Justice Department's place, would you go to the 11th Circuit and try to get her pushed off the case? I absolutely will. It's not just that she was reversed twice in two months. It's why she she was reversed. Right. She was reversed, the court said, because she had no jurisdiction. What that means is that under the law, she had no business deciding some of the things that she actually decided. The Court of Appeals also said that she treated the president differently than she would other criminal defendants, or in that case, people who were the subject of search warrants. And she admitted that in her 
opinion. And the Court of Appeals said that's not how the rule of law works. The other concern is that we know from the indictment that Trump's defense is not going to depend on the facts, because the facts are very incriminating. As Jill said, he's going to look to the judge to do things like limit the kind of evidence that can be presented. He's going to talk about attorney-client privilege, and he's going to try to delay the trial until after the election. Those would all be decisions that Judge Cannon makes. And, and when you say the, the evidence from um, attorney-client, he would try to use attorney-client privilege and hide behind it, that's because the bulk of the evidence comes from his own lawyer. That's and the, the, the thing that blew my mind um, this last week uh, when Alex Wagner uh, updated me on this information is that Evan Corcoran still represents Donald Trump. He's still his lawyer. But his whole fate, Donald Trump's, rests in the hands of the lawyer. The lawyer is the one who took contemporaneous notes, much as Michael Cohen his former lawyer, is a lot of the reason he's indicted in New York. In this case, it is the testimony from his lawyer. If this judge tries to rule that inadmissible, that's the case. Uh, there would be a big issue. There's something called the law of the case, which suggests that Judge Cannon should follow the lead of the uh, chief judge in the District of, of uh, Columbia, who said that that attorney-client privilege had been breached when Trump right. tried to use Corcoran to commit crimes. Right. But again, that's a decision that Judge Cannon would ultimately have to make. The concern is that even if she makes an egregious error of law, if Trump prevails, that is, he's found not guilty, the government can't appeal. 